selected me to be one of the 24 Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors to fly on SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, this past March. <clears throat> SOFIA, with its 100-inch telescope, is the largest moving astronomical observatory in the world. Before I tell you more about this adventure at 45,000 feet and why it matters, I need to give you a bit of context. Let me tell you my story. My mother is Canadian. She's a translator, an editor the kind of person who was curious to take calculus while pursuing a degree in English. <laughs> that shouldn't be a joke, but I guess it is. <laughs> she fell in love with my Greek father, a mathematician, a poet, a cook, and a wicked storyteller. They got married in Canada, and they left Canada to go to Greece when I was going into third grade. In our family, we spoke English, we spoke Greek. We spoke the language of T.S. Eliot and the language of Odyssea Selitis. We spoke the language of words and the language of numbers. In our family, we moved between worlds. I fell in love with astronomy when I was five. My mother recalls we were walking down the street and I looked up at her and said, Mommy, how are stars born? I don't remember that. I do remember that when I was in ninth grade in Greece, uh, a career counselor told me, you can't be an astronomer. Your eyesight isn't good enough. <laughs> it's funny now, but at the time, it was like a door slamming in my face. Physics was my next alternative. So I studied hard. I studied hard to take the university entrance exams, and I had high enough grades to enter the physics program at the University of Athens. While I was in my junior year, Voyager 2 flew by Neptune. Data from this flyby made me think, ah, oh, yes, astronomy. It rekindled that interest, that passion. Until then, I felt like I was in this room with all these people who loved astronomy but are told, you can't do that. The doors were open, and I was in. And I thought, I should pursue graduate studies. I should cross the Atlantic. As a graduate student, I crossed the Pacific as well. I'm standing here at 9,000 feet. Uh, above the clouds, you can see them there in the background. On Mauna Kea, the big islands of Hawaii, where I was collecting data for my thesis. In 1994, serendipity struck, and a comet, Schumacher-Levy, struck Jupiter. The whole world watched for a week while this was taking place. For the first time ever, an astronomical event was being broadcasted all across the world over the internet. The whole world watched while pieces of comet smashed into the gas giants. For me, this was a weak crash course in outreach, right? We had over 2,000 people come to the campus of the University of Waterloo to learn more about the comet. I realized I was good at outreach, and I liked it. But I had to think about my career. So I put this little interlude in my pocket, and with PhD in hand, I said, OK, I'm going to follow the, the path, the usual path. I'm going to look for a postdoctoral research position, hopefully somewhere in Southern California, where my husband was also a postdoc. Happily, Caltech hired me to work on an infrared satellite called WIRE. For over a year, I was part of this group where I was a liaison between the principal investigators of the project and 12 groups of scientists who wanted to use the instrument. The launch was beautiful. We got to the right height for the satellite. Everything looked good. But there was a power surge. 
And that super sensitive, super cool detector got flooded with sunlight and fried. The mission was over. My job was over. My career as I envisioned it was over. And I was devastated. In my grief, I had to make a choice to remain in California and join another project or to come to Milwaukee, where my husband was, and teach. At that moment, we decided that the end of WIRE was going to be the beginning of our family. So I moved to Milwaukee, and I taught astronomy to large groups of undergraduate students. I also brought two boys in the world, with all the busyness that entails. The director of the planetarium retired, and I was asked, could you please be an interim director? while we find somebody else. And I reluctantly agreed, because it felt like a step, again, away from my research path. But then I started presenting at the planetarium. And I thought, oh, this is the job for me. <laughs> Truly, I applied for the job. And then I started worrying, what happens if they don't give me the position? But they did in January of 2007. I enjoy bringing science to more people of all ages. In my experience, people are hungry to learn more about the universe and, and how we know. An example, we had a black hole bash where we highlighted black holes, right? How cool is that? <laughs> we had expert talks, planetarium programs, a cookout, live music. We had a large interactive display. People are hungry. They want to know more. And they don't shy away from these tricky questions. What's my role? I'm bilingual. I can convey the deep scientific ideas without the baffling jargon. But let's get back to Sophia. NASA selected me to be an Airborne Astronomy Ambassador because of my kind of bilingualism. NASA and society overall, I think, needs more people like me who can showcase current astronomical and scientific research. Let me tell you about my 20 hours in the stratosphere. The telescope looks like it's moving, but in fact, it's locked in space. What you're seeing is the, the airplane itself is moving. There were 25 people on the 747 we had telescope operators, uh, mission control people, computer experts, safety techs, pilots, of course, and our cohort of ambassadors. Our job was to talk to everybody on board and also on the ground to find out what kinds of projects they do, but also how they got there, what was their career path to where they are. What a trip. From the safety training, from that streamlined pre-flight meeting, where the only information that people said was the information that mattered for that flight. The clean way that people followed procedures and solved problems on the fly, all of it made me feel just surrounded by utter competence. I also felt a thrilling jolt in the cockpit of a 747 while we landed. I sing on the cake, I saw northern lights. Not just blobs on the horizon, but these beautiful, broad streams of color dancing in the sky. Obviously, this was a once in a lifetime adventure for me. So why do you care? I wanted to care, I want you to care. Because I want us to take that curiosity, that energy, that problem solving out of the belly of the airplane and in the world, in the ballpark, in the mall, in the grocery store. I want you to be part of our next adventures. And what adventures am I talking about? Could it be Europa, the marble moon of Jupiter? It has a crust of ice. 
and underneath a liquid ocean. We are building machines right now that are going to explore that ocean and look for interesting organic chemistry, possibly even signs of life. What about Mars? We've been sending machines to Mars for almost 50 years. Are we going to send people there? Oh, that's a hard problem. A lot of us are going to need to talk science before we can make that happen. So imagine a world where we all speak science, where we can all appreciate the elegance of an idea, the cleverness of a solution, the complexity of life, and the enormity of our cosmos. Imagine a world where you go to the dentist or the hair salon, and you flip the magazine, and the romances of Hollywood stars get dwarfed by the real stars, by the real news. Comet sighting spring is approaching Mars, and we are poised to see it from ringside seats, thanks to a machine called MAVEN. It just arrived in orbit of Mars last Sunday. MAVEN is poised to see the interaction of the comet toward Mars. This is my world. I am opening the door. El Ate Mesa, I'm inviting you in. We can all speak science. We can rekindle that, that curiosity we're born with. How are stars born anyway? But it doesn't have to be rocket science. It can be everyday things. We can ask questions like, how does the circuit board work? Or what causes lightning? How does this button get made? I want you to speak science. I want us all to speak science. Will you fly with me? Thank you. <laughs>